Hi everyone, my name is Chevron Edwards and today we will be discussing creating and writing visual arts lesson plans. Now lesson plans are the most important part of the teaching process. You have to get your plans right and then your lessons will go right. Now lesson plan writing is a nightmare for most people but it's not as hard as you think it is. So the aim of this video today is to highlight the basics as it relates to writing lesson plans and to get into some detailed aspects of writing lesson plans. Now, the video might be long, but guess what? The content is rich, so I'm inviting you to stay tuned and just stick to the process. Seems like a lot, but it's actually not. Once you get the hang of it, it comes naturally. All right, so let's get right into it. All right, so let's firstly discuss what a lesson plan is. A lesson plan is simply a guide that a teacher prepares to carry out their method of instruction. All right? So, it's simply those written down plans for execution that will help them to achieve the objectives that they've set out. Now, a lesson plan is built upon three main components. Learning objectives, learning activities, and assessment. Now, a lesson plan is written based on the curriculum, which we discussed before. If you have not seen that video, I invite you to check that video out. The lesson plan must be written based on the curriculum because it will help the teacher navigate the best methods, the best topics, the best ideas, the best concepts to explore in their lesson. All right. So if you have not, not seen the curriculum video, I recommend that you see the curriculum video before you get into this lesson plan video. All right. So a lesson plan provides you with a general outline of your teaching goals, your learning objectives, and the means to which you will accomplish them. So it's where you want to go and how you will get there and how you will know if you got there. All right? So let's move forward. Now, before we go any further, I want us to discuss STEM lesson plans. Now, STEM is an approach that is now being used by educators and pushed by the Ministry of Education for us to interlock the subject areas. In other words, we don't want the students to think subjects are independent of each other, but rather that they are one body of knowledge with just different arms and different legs. So the STEM is a curriculum based on the idea of educating students in four specific disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, there's also one particular method called STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. But most institutions are currently using the STEM approach. We'll discuss that in another video. So let's move forward. Now here's an example of how the STEM map is used to guide the planning of a lesson. All right, so the topic here is monochromatic paintings. Now you can see how monochromatic painting is related to each area under the STEM approach. You can see how it's related to the science, which is the color theory, how it's related to mathematics, which is geometric shapes, how it's related to e-design, which is very obvious. So you can create and follow a plan or work of solution, test it out, it's problem solving. And the technology, color mixing, constructing, etc. All of these are different approaches are different methods you can use and explore while teaching monochromatic paintings. All right, so this is an example of how to integrate. All right, so we have some formalities before getting started. All right, so when we're getting started, this is the basic layout for what you're supposed to have. All right, so you have the teacher's name, the date, the duration, the grade, the stage of artistic development for visual arts plans, subject, focus question, theme, topic, unit, title, slash unit, the visual arts strands and the attainment targets, all right? Now, some of this information is directly from the curriculum and some of the information you will provide. For example, the information you will provide includes teacher's name, date, duration, grade, stage of artist development, subject, and topic. Everything else is extracted directly from the curriculum. And these include focus question, theme, unit, 
visual arts strands and attainment targets, all extracted from the lesson plan. So this part is fairly easy and fairly simple. Now the next segment of the first part of the lesson plan is the STEM section. Now, as we mentioned earlier, it refers to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, this also can be extracted directly from the curriculum. All right. So these are the different areas that this lesson will be focused on. What you do, you look at the curriculum and you examine the topic that you're doing and the unit, and then you extract these accordingly, depending on the topic. You can even add a few if you wish but you have to ensure that they fit directly within these standards. All right, now that we've taken care of the basics of the lesson plan and done the formalities, let us examine the learning objectives. All right, the learning objective is critically important to the lesson. So pay close attention and ensure that you take notes if you need to. Now your objectives are basically your goals. Simply put, it's what you want them to be able to do at the end of the lesson. The skills you want them to attain by the end of the lesson. What you want them to understand, what you want them to know by the end of the lesson. All right? And what should the lesson prepare them to do? All right? So, According to Dick and Cleary, a performance objective is a detailed description of what students will be able to do when they complete a unit of instruction. It is referred to as a behavioral objective or an instructional objective. All right. So it's all about what you want them to accomplish. All right. Now, how can I write good learning objectives? This is a question that many students ask and many instructors ask because the quality of your objectives will determine the quality of the lesson. All right, so let's look into it. Well, the first thing you need to understand is the depth of knowledge. All right, there are four levels that you will look at for the depth of knowledge. All right, so you have level one, which is recall, level two, which is skill and concept, level three, strategic thinking, and level four, extended thinking. And then you can see the verbs that are used to construct these objectives. All right, so we're going to look a little bit further, a little deeper into that. Now, the depth of knowledge basically refers to how deep you want the students to go into the matter, how deep you want them to go into the content. All right, so level one is basically recalling. All you need to do is remember. All you want the students to do is to remember, to be able to define. All right, but what about level two? So level two now, the students have to identify, summarize, right? The major events in the narrative. So outside of defining, they need, they need to identify it, which will show that they have a level of understanding and then summarize, which would be interpreting the information. It's no longer about just recalling, but interpreting, which is very critical. All right, so after they have interpreted it now they need to support this is level three now support ideas with details and examples so after they have summarized they need to justify prove gather evidence all right and we'll move on to level four now this is where the student conduct a project that requires specifying a problem designing so now that they have gathered all this information they need to now create something with the information that they have found gathering data gathering information and this is how the depth of knowledge changes at each level and this is why it's important for you to pay attention to the depth of knowledge because you don't want a lesson where the students are just required to remember to recall and define you need to have it a lesson where the students have to interact with the material have to draw their own conclusions have to summarize for themselves have to explain have to create something from this new knowledge that they have found all right all right, so now let's explore the learning domains. Now well, there are three learning domains that are commonly used in writing lesson plans. They're the cognitive, affective, and psychomotor domains. Each tackle a different thing. Cognitive refers to the person's thinking process, their thought process, their analysis of the information. Affective refers to their feelings, how it impacts them. And psychomotor refers to their skills, 
the fine motor skills and their practical aspect of the lesson. All right, so you can see the different categories there under each. You can pause the video, explore them, read through them, and get familiar with them. I'm going to be moving forward as we have a lot to do. So feel free to pause if you wish to delve in more into the information. Now, Bloom's taxonomy is the next area that we need to explore and understand when we're writing objectives. It looks somewhat similar to the depth of knowledge, but there are some differences to it. Now, it structures the level of the student's thinking into common words. Remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. So it breaks it down a little bit more than in the depth of knowledge. All right, if you remember, the depth of knowledge had levels, which are four levels. Now, this now has six, six different levels that are broken down into a simple, simple verbs. Now, if you look carefully, you realize that it works from base to the top. All right, with the top being the highest, higher order thinking, and the base being the lowest, lower order thinking. Now, for the base, you see, remember. Remember means you just the students should just be able to reproduce what you have given them. Remember, recall, all right? Memorize, which is very simple, all right? So it, students can just rehearse information and reproduce it. Now, this is what the STEM integration wants to move away from. It wants person to be able to understand and produce from themselves, which brings us to the next level, which is understand. Now, when somebody understands, they can explain and impart the information to somebody else. All right. It's a little bit more complex than remembering, but at the same time, it's still a form of lower order thinking. Now, we'll move to the application. Application is more difficult. When you understand the information, it means that you can apply it in real life, con real life context. And in your application of that information, you can solve problems, demonstrate, and interpret, operate. So this is what you want the students to be able to do. All right. You want them to remember. You want them to understand. You want them to apply. All right. But we still need to get a little bit more in depth. All right, so we're moving to analyze. So analyze now you'll be able to draw a conclusion. You're presented with problems. When you present the students with problems, can they assess based on what they remember, assess based on what they understand, assess based on what they have applied to analyze and determine whether or not this conclusion can be drawn, this can be distinguished, this can be etc. All right, now when they move to evaluate now, Evaluate now, it's a little bit more complicated than analysis now. Now they can argue, they can defend, they can justify. All right, so it's more scientific, they can prove. All right, and they will move to create now when they have gone through all of these levels and they have mastered the content, then now they can use their knowledge to create, construct, develop, formulate, and investigate. So you see the different levels at which the students are operating. Now that we understand the components, which are depth of knowledge, Bloom's taxonomy, the different levels at which students think, the different verbs that we use to write these objectives, now let's write them. Now the right mix of objectives help to create the perfect lesson. Now, you do not want a, a lesson that has too much higher order or too much lower order. You want a mixture because you have to take into consideration the time that it will take to ex execute these objectives. Now, if you've noticed, the domains have been identified. It is very important for you to identify the domains when writing your lesson plans as you score points for these aspects of the lesson, as well as it helps you as the writer of the plans to understand what you're looking for and which particular area you're tackling it. All right. <clears throat> now, try to identify the lower order objectives and the higher order objectives based on the verbs that are seen there. All right. Now, as you can see, the lower order objectives have been identified. Define monochromatic painting. 
To find monochromatic painting, all the student needs to do is remember the definition. All right? Now, let's look at the other law and the other objective. Explain the steps taken to create tones. Now, it's a little bit more complex than define, but at the same time, it's still a lower order objective because of the verb use, which is explained. And lower order, again, discussing groups, how colors make them feel. Now, it deals with feelings. It deals with talking and communicating. It's a lower order objective. All right? So, let's look at the higher order objectives. Now, the higher order objectives are create. All right? The verb create helps you to understand that the students are applying the information that they have gathered, all right? So the first one says create a variety of tones using one color. They would have to apply their understanding of colors in order to create tones for that objective, all right? So the next objective says create monochromatic painting, all right? So creating the monochromatic painting would then now force them to use the skill set that they have, skills and information that they have gathered to create a monochromatic painting. All right? Now, the learning activities will be designed based on the 5E model lesson. So let's look at the 5Es. All right, so let's dive into the 5Es. They are engage, explore, explain, extend, slash, elaborate, and evaluate. Now, the 5Es is a constructive approach to, constructivist approach to learning, which simply means that it is student-centered. The students are the main persons who are in charge of their learning and therefore, the teacher acts as a facilitator for most of the lesson. All right. So engagement is the first, followed by explore, followed by explain and elaborate and then evaluate. But evaluation is done throughout the lesson because you need to assess whether or not the students are getting it, they are meeting the objectives that you have set out and so forth. All right. So you do evaluate right through the lesson, but you do a formal evaluation at the end of the lesson. All right. So let's dive into it even more. Now, the first stage is the engagement stage, all right? And the purpose of the engagement is to get the students hyped and pumped and excited about the lesson, to pique their interest and get them curious about what is going to take place, to get them personally involved while assessing their prior knowledge, understanding their past experiences and making connections, meaningful connections to the content. All right, so we're going to look down at the role of each person, all right? as it relates to the students and teachers at the engagement stage. All right, so let's look at the engagement stage and the expectations of the teachers and the students at this stage. Well, the teachers are expected to raise questions, elite responses. These are to pick up the students' prior knowledge and to help the teacher to understand what they already know. All right, it helps the students to make connection to previous work. How is today's topic related to what we have done before? It posts learning outcomes, explicitly references them in the lesson, invites the students to express what they think, and invites them to raise their own questions. So it's a, the teacher's role is to facilitate and to provoke and to promote, all right, at this particular stage. What about the students? So the students are expected to ask questions at this stage. They're expected to be curious and express their curiosity at this stage, all right? And they should express their ideas at this stage and express their current understanding of a concept or idea at this stage, all right? So it's a big, a lot of sharing at this particular stage. Now, what's the purpose of the exploration stage? The purpose of the exploration stage is to get the students involved in the topic, provide them with a chance to build their own understanding. So, right, after you have introduced the lesson, you want to get the students involved now, all right? Help them become a part of the process, all right? Now, let's look at the teachers and students' role. Let's examine the roles of the students and teachers during the exploration. Now, the teachers are supposed to provide, clarify questions or problems, all right? 
provides common experiences, observe and listen to the students as they interact, act as a consultant, all right? Encourage student-to-student -student interaction, ask probing questions to help the students make sense of their experiences and redirect them when necessary. Provides us time for the students to puzzle through problems. So that at this particular time, the teacher doesn't do any teaching. The teacher facilitates the students by guiding them on the right path. You can guide them on the right path by simply posing questions. All right, whenever you see them falling off track or deviating from what you want them to focus on, you interact with them and get them back on track because this stage is for the students to explore the material. So the students test predictions and hypothesis, forms new predictions and hypothesis, all right? Discuss problems with others, all right? So they're extracting information from each other. Plan and conduct investigation in which they observe, describe, and record data. Tries different ways to solve a problem or answer a question. Creates initial models, compares ideas, and those of others, all right? Compares ideas with those of others, all right? So this stage is all about exploring, as the teacher says, as the topic suggests. Now our next stage is explanation. The purpose of the explanation stage is to provide the students with an opportunity to communicate what they have learned so far and figure out what it means. Now, these are the roles of the teachers and the students during the exploration stage. The teacher encourages the students to explain concepts and def definitions in your own words, ask for justification, evidence, and clarification from students, formally provides definitions, explanations, and information through mini lecture, text, internet, or other sources, builds on students' explanation and provides time for students to compare their ideas with others and if desired, raise their, revise their ideas. Now this is where the teacher gets into the meat of the matter and start teaching the students, all right? Now the student's role here is to show models, explanations, answers, or possible solutions to other students. Listen critically and listen, cri listen critically and Question explanations offered by others. Explains using evidence from investigation. Uses labels, terminologies, and formal scientific language. Compares current thinking to former thinking. Record ideas and current understanding. Adjust ideas, models, and explanations as new evidence or reasoning is presented. Now our next stage is the extend slash elaborate stage. All right, and the purpose of this stage is to allow the students to use their new knowledge and continue to explore its implications. All right. Now the extend and elaborate stage. Let's look at how the teacher's role and the student's role interlock here. All right. So the teachers are expected to create situations that force the students to apply new concepts all right it forces students to analyze their understandings all right and draw meaningful conclusions all right so it says here that the teachers strategies expect students to use vocabulary definitions and explanations provided previously in new contexts so they're using the information they have gathered in new situations which are created by the teacher, all right? So the teacher, again, is a facilitator here, and he's just creating the atmosphere for the students to solve the different situations or different problems that are posed before them. All right, let's look at the students' behaviors. Now, the students here start to apply knowledge. They start to make meaningful connections, draw conclusions, and then now make assumptions, hypotheses, a part of the scientific process and then communicate their understandings to others, all right? Now, the evaluation is the final stage and the purpose of the evaluation is for both the students and the teachers to determine how much learning actually took place, all right? Now, informally, it is done right through the lesson, but the formal evaluation is done at the end of the lesson.
All right, let's dive a little deeper into the evaluation. Now, for the teachers, the evaluation process is all about asking questions. It's all about provoking the students to think, provoking the students to let you know what they understand and ask them to justify their answers, to reason out the answers, to explain themselves, all right? This is a part of the lesson that the teacher records notes as well as the students demonstrate individual understanding of the concepts. Individual understanding is very critical part of the evaluation because the teacher only the teacher needs to know whether or not each individual is understanding the concepts and the lessons taught. Because many times there are a few learners who get lost in the crowd and the group answers and the course answers. And we need to know who is learning, who is not learning, the extent to which they're learning, etc. Alright, so the teacher provides opportunities for the students to assess their own progress. Alright? So use they also use a variety of assessment to gather evidence of the student's understanding. And we'll be looking at the assessment shortly. Now the students' behaviors at the evaluation give feedback to other students, evaluates progress of or progress or knowledge, checks work with the rubric or against established criteria, assess progress by comparing current understanding with prior knowledge. So they do some form of reflection as well. All right, so it's all about the students comparing what they know now to what they didn't know now to determine how much they have grown knowledge in terms of knowledge and understanding. Now let's look at the assessment. Now in education, assessment refers to the wide variety of methods or tools that the educators use to evaluate, measure, and document the academic readiness, learning, progress, skill, acquisition, or educational needs of the student. It's all about finding out whether or not the students have met the criteria, have met the objectives of the lesson. All right? So there are two types of assessment. You have formative and summative, and we'll be looking at both of them now. But the formative assessment refers to a wide range of methods that the teacher uses to conduct the in-process evaluations. All right? So it's while you're teaching, you want to look whether or not the students are grasping the content because you don't want to spend an hour teaching. And then you realize at the end of the hour that the students don't understand one thing that you have done. Teaching cannot take place unless learning has taken place. All right, so the formative assessment is an ongoing assessment. It's when you're asking the students that they understand it's whether or not they, they are making the right conclusions. It's you all about you evaluating them at each stage. Remember earlier we said that evaluation takes place informally throughout. So it's all about you making sure that the students get the content and provide little questions. Those guided questions help you to gather knowledge on whether or not they're grasping the concept or not. All right? Well, summative assessments. Summative assessments are used to evaluate the student's learning, skill, acquisition, and academic achievement at the conclusion of a defined instructional period. So this is what is done at the evaluation section of the lesson where the students are given tests or assignments or activities for you to be able to determine if they have learned and the extent to which they have learned. All right, so it's a more formal approach to the assessment that allows you to have data, to collect data that determines whether or not the students have learned and assess the objectives of the lesson. Now, this normally has a criteria or a rubric that the students will have to meet or that you will use to mark the lesson. All right, now summative assessments are given at the conclusion of a specific instructional period and they're therefore, and therefore they are generally evaluative rather than diagnostic. All right, so you want to use it to determine the extent which you have learned, your learners have grasped the concept and it also helps you to assess whether or not the students have met the objectives. All right? Now, here are some other components of the lesson that you need to pay attention to. All right? The first one is the content page. 
Now the content page is the area that you put all your material. This is in, this includes your content, information, pictures, and any samples that you'll be using, as well as your teaching aids. All right, so you need to pay close attention to that. The last page now is where you have the references. The references is the last page of your plan and it highlights the sources that you used. And that's pretty straightforward. All right, so you need to include all the sources that you used as it relates to your content and your methods. All right, so that's basically it. Now, if you have any questions, you can shoot them to me at chevronedwards at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. All the best. See you soon.